So basically, at this point, we are investigating uh, the dominant negative effect of uh, heterozygous mutations in factor 13b gene. So factor 13 is actually uh, the last coagulation protein in the coagulation cascade, and it plays an important role uh, in stabilizing the fibrin clot. So basically, once uh, fibrinogen is converted into fibrin, initially fibrin is held together non-covalently. So at that point, the activation of factor 13 takes place, and factor 13 plays a crucial role at that point to stabilize that, that preformed clot into an insoluble clot. So if, let's say, there is a deficiency of factor 13, it can cause that this destability in that clot, and then it can be more susceptible to fibrinolysis. Therefore, factor 13 deficiency can be differentiated into an acquired form of factor 13 deficiency, or it could also be inherited factor 13 deficiency. Um, we are mostly focused on the inherited part, and inherited factor 13 deficiency is further divided into severe form of factor 13 deficiency and slightly milder factor 13 deficiency. So severe deficiency is basically when there is a homozygous or compo compound heterozygous mutations in factor 13A1 or factor 13B gene. It is very well characterized, very well studied, and uh, most of the mutations in form of severe factor 13 deficiency are found in factor 13A1 gene. Um, but on the other hand, the mild factor 13 deficiency, which is li largely undiagnosed, uh, it is basically due to uh, heterozygous mutations in factor 13A1 or factor 13B gene. However, unlike factor 13, uh, severe factor 13 deficiency, uh, in case of mild factor 13 deficiency, the proportion between mutations in factor 13A1 and B gene is around 50%, which means that in milder form, we see a lot more mutations, heterozygous mutations in factor 13 B gene. Like I said earlier, the clinical characterization of factor 13 deficiency has so far been performed for severe factor 13 deficiency, but our group, we are mostly working on the subclinical uh, stages of factor 13 deficiency, which I said earlier is mild factor 13 deficiency. It's actually asymptomatic, unless or until it is, uh, the patient is exposed to some severe trauma. So there, if there's an excessive bleeding, let's say, if there's an accident, if there is like removal of the tooth. At that stage, there's this manifestation of these factor 13 uh, deficient patients. So there's an excessive bleeding, there's excessive bruising, and delayed wound healing in case of um, these mild factor 13 deficient patients. So, so far in the literature, there are eight heterozygous mutations found in factor 13 B gene. Um, so out of those eight mutations, I mean, in previously they have been studied, uh, but they have never truly been studied in the heterozygous state. So, so in the previous studies, they did found some sort of secretory deficits because of these heterozygous mutations. So what we wanted, we wanted to actually mimic uh, this heterozygous state, and then we wanted to establish uh, the dominant negative causality of these mutations. So out of these eight mutations, we decided to choose 16 mutations because uh, uh, cysteine plays an important role um, as, a, as, a, as a structural uh, subunit of factor 13b protein. Um, therefore, if there is a mutation in cysteine, it can cause disruption and it can cause problems. So <clears throat> initially, we wanted to study if this dominant negative effect is caused intracellularly or extracellularly. For the intracellular part, we performed immunofluorescence studies and uh, followed by the antigenic estimation. So, one of these mutations showed a very interesting pattern. For one of the mutations, which was cysteine 5 arginine, we saw that there was an accumulation found intracellularly as compared to the wild type. And the other two mutations, we do not see any accumulation. We see the reduction as compared to the wild type. So when we realized, okay, there is a some sort of accumulation, some sort of secreted defect for cysteine 5 arginine, we performed the antigenic estimation. And again, we saw a similar pattern in the Western blot. We saw that somehow this mutant is forming multimeric complexes. So basically, it should be around 80 kilo delta, but we also see higher bands at 150 and 220. So we were like, okay, what could be the possible reason? So if we believe uh, because of uh, this free unpaired cysteine, because of the heterozygous mutations, it is forming non-native disulfide bonds, possibly within the factor 13b protein or with the neighboring protein, we do not know. So out of these three cysteine mutations, we could clearly see that this cysteine 5-arginine mutation is definitely causing intracellular accumulatory dominant negative effect.
So now what about the other mutations? What kind of dominant negative factor they are causing? For that, we wanted to study them extracellularly. Because factor 13 is a complex protein. It is formed by a combination of uh, a dimeric factor 13 A subunit and a dimeric factor 13 B subunit, which is held together. So this complex could be disrupted because of this mutation. In a purely homozygous state, it's understandable, but in heterozygous state, in order to manifest the dominant negative casualty, these mutations might be affecting some sort of complex, either the factor 13 B2 dimer formation or the factor 13 A2 B2 complex formation. Therefore, so far, there was no biophysical structure of factor 13 B known, but very recently, a colleague of mine and in our group, we managed to uh, resolve a partial cryo-EM structure of factor 13 A to B2. Uh, so we mapped these mutations on this structure, and based on that uh, as well, and also we had an alpha alpha fold model of factor 13 A to B2 complex earlier. So when we mapped these mutations on this, um, these models, we saw that these mutations lie far away from the interface of factor 13 A2 and B2, which means that most likely these mutations are not imparting any extracellular dominant negative effect because they are far away from the, the tetrameric assembly. But there is another possibility. There is a possibility that these mutations are disrupting the uh, factor 13 B2 dimer itself. Not the heteromer, but the dimer. Again, there is no biophysical structure of factor 13 B so far. But for that, right now, our group is also working in resolving uh, the uh, this problem. So we are performing uh, cryo-electron microscopy. And hopefully, once we have um, uh, a crystal structure of factor 13 B, we would like to map all these mutations on uh, this structure uh, in order to understand if the extracellular dominant negative effect of this mutation is due to the possible location of this mutation at the, at the, uh, at the interface of these two monomers, which could possibly explain what could cause the extracellular dominant negative effect. So we, again, like I said, this is extremely important because factor 13, mild factor 13 deficiency is considered clinically relevant and not clinically relevant because like I said it's largely asymptomatic so in order to manifest itself it has to have certain bleeding phenotype otherwise normally the patients maybe for years and years they will never exhibit and secondly also the bleeding symptoms really differ from patient to patient some people might not bleed uh, show the phenotype at all some people see uh, show some different phenotypes therefore we believe in order to understand uh, the underlying dominant negative effect. When we under understand the underlying dominant negative effect, it will give us proper understanding of the pathomolecular me mechanism which are causing this variability in, in the mild factor 13 deficient patients.